Hello and welcome to The Quest on Rajya Sabha TV. I am Rakhi Bakshi. This show gives you deep insight into the life, career and vision of a leading personality. And that leading personality is known as One Woman Tiger Team. Her name is Belinda Wright. She is a well-known conservationist and also a wildlife campaigner, somebody who's really worked tirelessly for protection of tigers in India. And today she is with us. Belinda Wright, welcome to the show. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, tell us more about yourself. Today we know... Uh, about you as somebody who's really fighting so much to protect tigers in India. But how did it all begin and what was your childhood like I mean, where, when you were growing up? Well, I was born in Calcutta and I had, was very lucky that I had, uh, my parents were both very, very interested in wildlife and my mother was a leading conservationist of, of, of her time. Um, and, and so I had this wonderful childhood where we went, spent all our holidays in, in tiger habitat in jungles and so on. So I, I, I really was, I mean, from the, from the but time somebody, I was your mother, born, uh, you looked up to because yes. she was also awarded the title of MBE. Yes. Uh, somebody who really, again, worked yeah. so much uh, uh, for wildlife. Mm. Uh, so how was it like looking up to her and thinking that maybe you could follow her? Well, it wasn't really like that. I mean, for me, as a child, you're, you're very influenced by what's around you. And I think, I think my parents were completely irresponsible because I was a seven-week-old baby in those days um, when they first took me into, into the jungle. Okay. And, you know, the roads were, were terrible in those days and it was in April, there was no electricity and so on. So, you know, I really was a, a child of the jungle and I'm, I'm deeply, you know, thrilled and so was, was the case with the father? Yes. Yes, my How father was... was um, was a complete, you know, jungle person. But in those days, it was there were a lot of people like that, and um, you know, there's this d debate about whether hunters are conservationists and so on. But in those days, it it was a way of life, and there were a lot of people that loved that sort of life. And how was Kolkata Day? day how were the Kolkata oh, days like? I'll, I was just so lucky. I had the most wonderful childhood, in the in the warmest, most sort of exotic city. Um, probably at that time in the world. And uh, despite all Calcutta's problems and, you know, the poverty in that area, and then, of course, it, it got uh, very bad um, in 1971 when there were a lot of refugees came in from Bangladesh and stuff. But it still was an incredible city to be brought up in. And there's still this sort of Calcutta gang of people. <laughs> and you love that. And, and I love that. Yeah, yeah but uh, then also the jungles of Bihar. Um, yes. How was that experience? Well, Bihar was, was, you know, very, very special and historically very interesting and so on. It's, it, you know, it's changed, but, it, but certainly um, up to the time of independence, Bihar was one of the great um, states or parts of, 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 of India. So, yes. So, let's say as a teenager and what we understand is that at 16 you took the first photograph of a wild tiger. Is that true? Um, yes. How do you know so much about me? <laughs> Um, yes, no, I had, I, um, it, it, was, it was very exciting. I was, I was sitting in a hide, um, and I think it was at, it, Billy Arjun, I was staying with Billy Arjun Singh, and, and a tiger came out in front of the hide and sat in the water. And then shortly after that, the tiger came round behind the hide, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was open. Um, so, yes, so my whole childhood. And, so how and do you feel today when we talk about also this whole serious threat that we are losing tigers? So as a child, let's go back and forth and now. Uh, how do you feel those days when still, uh, you know, one could relate so much to the surroundings and wildlife? And today there is more and more development, but there's this increasing concern about how we're protecting our environment and also wildlife. Well, I, I'm, I think... Probably what upsets me most that was in the in the late 1960s and early 1970s. There was all this. I mean, it was it was quite contained and selective, but there was this huge panic, um, and and um, Prime Minister the then Prime Minister mm. Mrs Indira Gandhi took up the cudgels. But yeah. there was this huge panic about tigers and how few there were. Mm. But um, I, I I I'm horrified that all these years later because oh, Project Tiger was, was, began in 1973. All these years later, the panics are still there, the problems are still there. And hundreds and hundreds of crores later, we may not have any more tigers than we did then, and we certainly have a lot more problems. This certainly and, sounds very you know, threatening to me also individually. That's tragic. But Project no. Tiger, something that got started, how much do you think it has worked on 
uh, really the subject in terms of protecting the tigers or doing, I mean, so many guidelines are there? Well, I think when Project Tiger began, when it was launched, um, it was the most tenacious um, and at its time the most successful conservation project ever in the world. But it didn't move with the times. So when it started, um, it focused on protecting tiger habitat, on managing tiger habitat for tigers. Mm. But when the new threat of poaching began, mm. it didn't move with the times. And that's, you know, that's the, the thing we all have to live with. But, uh, yeah, so uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, both the citizen-government interface, in terms of doing, coming together to really solve this problem and really protecting our tigers and wildlife together, uh, how much do you think we should have moved and we have not? Well, I think the, certainly the authorities, the ministry, and what was then Project Tiger, denied this whole problem of poaching. And that's where, they, where the problem began. And now they've accepted that it's a big problem and, and, and so on. But, but part, part of the, it's, it's not just tiger conservation, a lot of things in, it, it, that, yeah. that happen in India. A lot of it now depends on the actions of the state governments. Mm, exactly. That's, the, that, and, that's one of the key, actually, that yes. I wanted to ask and you so, about. So that, that, that's a huge stumbling block because then it depends on whether the state governments are going to react or not. But isn't that being worked on? Um, up to a point. Yes, that's a brief <laughs> but the answer that tells us a lot. Uh, uh, so, so tell us, I mean, we'll move again or from that 16-year-old to somebody who is today also mm. uh, fighting so much. How has the whole experience been uh, in terms of... Uh, you know, I mean, I know that when you talk today and when you talk right now talking to us, uh, I know your frustration sometimes that kind of also reflects as to why things are not happening so much and why people don't understand. So where do you think that lack of understanding pinches you? I don't think people care enough. I don't think, um, I don't think our political leaders have made, a, a, you know, a solid decision that we have to whatever the cost, save India's wildlife. And, and maybe, maybe, maybe they don't quite understand that India's natural heritage is extraordinary. It's probably the greatest natural heritage on this planet. And an animal like the, the tiger, which is um, you know, a magnificent animal that yeah. any country in the world would do anything to have, we should be, I mean, I don't think it's valued. I don't think, I don't think our natural heritage is valued the way but it should yes, be. But yes, so, so much about wildlife and tiger that we'll talk to you about. But right now we're talking to Miss Belinda, right? We'll keep talking to her after this very short break. Don't go away. You're watching The Quest. You're watching The Quest and we are talking to Miss Belinda, right? You know, when we hear every day about how we're losing tigers, it really scares us. And uh, you would know exactly the figures, but how much threatening it is, the situation. You can give us the details. Well, I think we still have probably around 1,700 wild tigers in India, but that's nothing. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the, the number of kids in a huge school. It's, it's very, very few. And um, I mean, this, I'm just thinking of the figures. This year alone, there have been 55 um, dead tigers found, of which 31 were, were killed by poachers. And so it, it, it's, it's quite, um, you know, we're losing them. Um, but of course, cubs are being born and old tigers die. But it's not good enough. You know, we, we've got to do much, much better than this to, to secure a future for, for wild tigers. And what do you think is happening or should be done uh, by the policymakers again or by authorities that are being made? So what is being done? Well, there's, um, there's a lot of guidelines being written. There's a lot of rules and regulations being written and distributed and so on. But everything is in the implementation. Okay, so what is the point of giving out all these guidelines and so on if, if they're not being implemented in the field where the wild tigers are? The government are? would say it's doing enough. So what mm. exactly are the impediments thereafter, the gaps I would say uh, on the ground, uh, what kind of challenges, let's when speak from okay. their side, that they face? Yeah, so uh, uh, the tiger is, is, has been saved on paper. 
put it like that. But in the field, tigers are not being monitored, they're not being protected, the staff is not being well looked after enough, the, the management is weak, we need more patrolling, we need much better um, legal uh, prosecution so that we get convictions and, and you know, uh, make deterrence for, for poachers. And we don't have intelligence-led enforcement. Exactly. Uh, when you talk about those, uh, you know, these punishable acts and the kind of people who should have been punished, we, we understand that more than 1,000 who have, should have been punished, only 30 have been kind of either <laughs> yes. been convicted or sentenced, yes. which is such a dismal figure. Yes. Conviction rate is so low. So it doesn't, it's not a deterrent. And a lot of the, the professional tiger poachers, they go about in gangs. Um, and a lot of them are, are nomadic by nature, by culture, and so on. So as soon as they get bail, they vanish. Mm -hmm. a lot of the time you've led some of names. the investigative teams. Yes. That's the, you've been a part of that. So yeah. what's been the experience uh, that, you know, uh, let's say somebody like you or a team mm -hmm. who's worked tirelessly, but how it should have been involved in a macro frame? Uh, which is not happening again in terms of a proper investigation and information mm -hmm. uh, and also the kind of intelligence that it requires to understand the, the numbers, the figures mm -hmm. and what's not happening and what's happening. Well, unlike other crimes um, like murder or whatever, the, the crimes against tigers is um, it's an international crime because when a tiger is killed, say in, in Maharashtra, mm -hmm. it's not going to be sold in Maharashtra, the parts of it. It's going to go abroad, outside our, our, our borders. And most tiger parts um, end up in China. Mm. So um, you can't, that's why dealing, dealing it, uh, with it as a state issue is very difficult, because these are all border, uh, cross-border crimes. Mm. And so the government set up the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, yeah. um, which is based in, in Delhi and has um, offices around India. But that's got a chronicle staff shortage, chronicle lack of support. And why does that you happen? Know. Do you think because of the lack of experience the staff should be having or expertise that is required? I think it, it didn't settle down um, properly and it's also um, different, there's interdepartmental problems, uh, problems which, which are everywhere. But this is police versus forest department sort of thing. And um, the, the bureau is headed by um, an IPS officer, but it's under the Ministry of, of Environment and Forest. It's, it's complicated. But <laughs> How much do you expect, <laughs> frankly, from the ministry to go ahead on this? Well, we, we have nowhere else to, to, to look up to. The ministry has to do it. And a lot of it depends on the leadership. We've had um, two very active ministers. Um, but um, much gosh. needs to be done. Right? Much needs yeah, to be done. A few words yes. on that. Yes. Um, OK, so talking about poaching again, you're talking about the, this problem with China or other nations as well. And we know the route this via Nepal and then Tibet uh, mm. uh, is also in question. So how do we deal with this transnational organized crime that it has become in terms of uh, you know, how the tiger skin is being sold and it's a thriving trade today of so many billions. So uh, how do we deal with that? Well, I think um, India um, and the world, but India in particular should speak out at every opportunity and try and persuade China to ban all trade in all tiger products from any sources, captive or wild. Because at the moment in China, they allow tiger farms. Mm -hmm. They allow certain legal trade in, for instance, tiger skins mm -hmm. and stuff. And as long as that trade mm -hmm. in China is allowed legally, it becomes a route for illegal tiger products from India. And so I think the... So what about this joint know, commitment the of thing. the nations? I mean, mm -hmm. what is happening, let's say, at the international level in terms of cooperating with each other? Well, India has agreements with Nepal, Bangladesh, China, Russia, um, and so on, uh, to do with tigers. But um, that's, they don't make the difference, actually. It's, it needs the Prime Minister of India mm -hmm. to talk to his counterpart in China and say, look, you know, we want to be friends, we have these other problems, but this is a problem that we can... We need to, know, we need address, to address very seriously. Yes. 
um, and uh, the poaching is a threat uh, because so many people who are watching this and uh, we are also talking about this lack of awareness. So through this program, of course, we would like to tell others what are the real problems. This poaching has become a serious threat in terms of becoming a huge criminal activity. Uh, what is your sense as to uh, what's happening, the kind of scale it is and more that should be done again? Well, I, there are a number of threats to tigers, including habitat um, destruction and, and so on. But poaching is the sinister one because without even the management knowing, poachers can wipe out the entire population of tigers in a tiger reserve. They've done it in Sariska in 2005, they've done it in Panna in 2009, and they will do it again in other tiger reserves. So. Um, Poaching is a thing that needs to be addressed and which can be addressed with good enforcement, you know, good support to field staff and intelligence-led enforcement. So there's so much more that we have to talk about and we are talking right now to Miss Belinda I Don't go away, you're watching The Quest. You're watching The Quest, we're talking to Ms. Belinda, right? We're also talking about this whole uh, serious threat uh, which is being posed by less and less tigers that we have in India and this whole uh, perception and perspective that uh, we should have. And uh, in this regard, of course, uh, we'll ask her as to how easy it is to protect tigers. Tell us also. Well, tigers are, are amazing animals and it's actually very easy to, to save tigers. They just, they need space, they need water, they need food and they need protection. But otherwise, they breed well, they, they're, they're very adaptable. They get used to, to, to vehicle movement and they, get, they, they walk through villages without villagers even but that, knowing. That's exactly uh, where the problem is, <laughs> yes. since you talked about that space. Uh, whether yeah. uh, you, you, you only, who talked about this uh, no, ecotourism that Sundarban yeah. should, be, should not be having, mm. things like that, uh, and how we're talking about the rights of locals and villagers. Yes. Tell us more about that. How to really balance that, yeah. actually? That's the key question that when government gets into a you know, lot of problems yeah. and dilemmas? Well, at the moment, the tiger conservation battle is in, in cities like Delhi and Mumbai and Calcutta. And we haven't really uh, upped the ante, as it were, in rural areas, and in particular amongst um, the, the people who live around the fringes of the tiger reserves. And, and I, I, you know, these, this is, these are areas where, where I work and where my, my team at WPSI, we work on, on the fringe areas of places like, like Sundarbans and Tadoba and Kana and so on. And the people there really don't, they, they, they're not aware yet of, of how special this all, this all is and how important it is to India and what, what, how proud we are of the sacrifice that many of these people make. When, when their cattle get killed by tigers, okay, they, they get compensation, but still, they're the ones living, you know, right there on the, on the, on the sort of front of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And we need to involve them and, and get their support. Because many of the legislation that government plans, government also gets into this dilemma and the challenge yes. that it faces of how to balance the two, mm. uh, how to protect the rights of the villagers who are in and around yes. the area and how to also, of course, protect uh, tigers. So uh, that's one dilemma. And talking about legislation, this, these amendments in the Wildlife Protection Act, which have been uh, proposed and, of course, Parliament is looking at it, uh, uh, how much do you think uh, uh, is up there on the table? Well, the Wildlife Protection Act has not been amended since 2006. So it needs amendment, you know, all laws have to move with the times. And there's some very good things in, in this amendment. I would say, uh, for instance, the, the new chapters on CITES, which is very important as the only international agreement on, on illegal wildlife trade and legal wildlife trade. And then um, there's a completely new uh, chapter on invasive species, and this is the only place where this is mentioned. Um, penalties have been improved. Um, those are, you know, three very solid good things. There are some other sort of um, the concerns I have. One is of, of wild animals, just sort of before it, it specified that wild animals were, were the scheduled species, the species listed in the Act. Now it just means any wild animal in a protected area. That's potentially a problem. Um, and there's a few other um, kind of Do you think it's, uh, it's going to be very stringent at some fear? Some well, of the, 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 the problem is the that when you, has, yeah. I don't know, when you put penalties, there's a catch-22 here. When you put penalties, um, um, you, you strengthen your penalties, there's a danger that the judges will then hesitate 
to, to you know, deliver those penalties in a prosecution because they're so strong. So you have to balance that. And I think it'll be okay, and I, I think it's quite well balanced, and I, I hope judges will, will, will uh, feel comfortable about implementing it. Yeah, and uh, regarding other bills, the forest bill, whether it, uh, you yeah. know, it's been there. Um, so again, the same question. And uh, you talked about this cooperation coming from the states. Now, um, there is sort of again, uh, you know, a, a thought that how this cooperation should be maintained in the federal structure. Uh, yes. So what is happening there? I, I understand that there is the Tiger Conservation Foundation that they should mm -hmm. be making. Uh, what is happening there? Is there any movement in in terms of the states really getting more proactive? and, um, you know, putting in their best? Well, in some states, yes. So the problem is that now tiger conservation depends on, on the reaction of that particular state. So, for instance, an example is Maharashtra is very active. Mm -hmm. And the chief minister has been to a few tiger reserves and he's, he actually sits down and takes meetings on it and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but in other states, no. So, uh, but we can't we can't rely on the future. And it's of not our sustained. Also, only when a news yes. comes in that some there are, yes. there is some murmur, but then it dies mm. down, isn't it? That's right. So uh, uh, again, talking uh, about let's say what your uh, organization does, mm. um, Wildlife Protection Society mm. of India, uh, how much it is trying to make a difference? Well, oh, gosh, well, I, I mean, I've I've really done nothing else all my life, and I. I'm just I'm one of these people who is a complete workaholic and and I have a wonderful team of people. So we work on on we we tend to sort of do the difficult things like um a lot of anti-poaching work where we try and provide information and support to the state enforcement authorities um to curb wildlife crime and we work in um to try and reduce conflict so in areas where there's very you know like leopards killing killing people and it is a big problem mm -hmm. and and tigers and elephants raiding crops and so on um and then we have some community support programs particularly in in places like sundarbans where all our conservation work is actually done through Communities Talking support. about Sundarban and I refer to this ecotourism mm. thing, I mean, again, this whole question of how development, let's say the yeah. mining work happens, yeah. let's say the tourism happens, how to balance this two uh, is again a question which, will, which remains in front of us actually. Yeah. So, well, most of our wildlife areas are quite fragile, Sundarbans in particular. So what's been suggested by the state government there is real high, I mean, it's a bit of both, but there's a big chunk of very high-end tourism where you fly in with helicopters and this and that. And Sundarbans just could not survive that. It's a very fragile environment and also it's got incredibly uh, difficult weather uh, patterns and regular cyclones and things that would sort it out. I would say <laughs> anyway. You know, recently this news of a nine-year-old, uh, you know, tiger was captivated yeah. and getting treated and then got released. Yes. Uh, so, do you think that there's still this gap which is there in terms of understanding uh, of tigers as to how they should be kind of taken care of, or even in terms of the mm. healthcare facilities or um, you know the whole, mm. uh, you know, the whole surrounding that should be given. Well, I think Sundarbans is, is actually not a bad example of that. They do have vets there. They do have quite good facilities for um, capturing and releasing. And Sundarbans can't really be along the lines of the others. I mean, one of the big complaints is that that tiger was released without a collar. But the, the collars don't work well in Sundarbans because it's a mangrove yeah. area. And yeah. the tigers are swimming all the time there. It's amazing from one island to another. So the collars are not great success. But they haven't been able to get that message across. But in, in other parts of India, um, there's a huge gap where you, there's no vets, there's no people to come and tranquilize an in, injured tiger. And you know, there's a whole management uh, issues and no rescue facilities. And we, we're not very good at this. We could be a lot, lot As uh, I think there, there should have been more time to talk about this, but right now, <laughs> of course, we have to sadly wrap up. So uh, mm. lastly, anything, any message that you'd like to give, anything that you'd like to say to a whole lot of people who are watching this program? Well, particularly if there's any, any political leaders watching this program, um, please give this some thought. You know, it is one of India's greatest at assets. And we have to, whether it's a development project or whatever, it has to be sustainable. And we should never, ever compromise on India's 
extraordinary natural heritage. Ms. Belinda Wright, thank you for saving our tigers or making that effort and all the very best to you. Pleasure. And uh, we have been talking to Ms. Belinda Wright. Hope you watched this edition and liked it too. Thanks and goodbye. Namaskar. Thank you.